Hi guys. So today we are going to finish chapter 14, which is the blood. Now remember part one, we've already talked about the different types of blood cells. So we talked about erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. We talked about leukocytes, which are white blood cells and the five different types. Remember, never let monkeys eat bananas. That is the order of most numerous to least numerous. And then we talked about thrombocytes, which are the platelets. Now we're going to talk about the rest of the blood. So the blood plasma is actually 55% of the blood volume. It's mostly water, so it's clear and kind of straw colored. This is the liquid portion of the blood. It transports nutrients, gases, hormones, and vitamins. It also has some inorganic and organic chemicals. Very importantly, it helps regulate our fluid and electrolyte balance and maintain that pH. Plasma proteins are the most abundant dissolved solutes in the plasma. They're usually not used as an energy source. So these are going to be proteins like albumins and globulins and fibrinogen. Now, even though fibrinogen is the lowest in the percentage total there, it's going to be really important in blood clotting. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are the most important blood gases. We need to deliver oxygen to our cells and we need to get rid of carbon dioxide. There's also going to be some plasma nutrients like simple sugars and amino acids, nucleotides, and then triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol. Non-protein nitrogenous substances are, as the name implies, molecules that have nitrogen, but they're not proteins. So in plasma, we have some really important ones. Urea is the product of protein catabolism, and that's about 50% of the NPNs. Uric acid is the protein of nucleic acid metabolism, or catabolism, I should say, specifically. Amino acids we are left with when we break down proteins through digestion. Creatine is stored energy in our phosphate bonds, and that's going to help regenerate ATP in our muscle cells. And creatinine is the product of creatine metabolism. So when we're breaking down and creating creatine, creatinine is going to be a product. Our bun is our blood urea nitrogen content. It actually indicates the health of a kidney. If the level is too high, that usually indicates that there's something wrong with your renal function because you're not excreting urea like you should. So all of these substances, even though they're non-protein nitrogenous substances, they're still really important and they let us know how our kidneys are functioning. Electrolytes are ions that ionize in water. They can conduct electricity and they're absorbed from the intestine or released as byproducts of cellular metabolism. Some really important ones, potassium, calcium, sodium, chloride, magnesium, bicarbonate, phosphate, and sulfate. Sodium and chloride are the most abundant electrolytes, and we're going to talk about them a lot, along with potassium and calcium. Bicarbonate becomes really important when we talk about regulating our pH. We have to have a way to stop bleeding. Everybody gets cut, so... Hemostasis is the proper terminology for stoppage of bleeding. There's a few actions that are going to limit or prevent blood loss. It starts with a blood vessel spasm or a vascular spasm, where the blood vessel is actually going to spasm and contract to try to keep the ends close together to limit that blood loss. Platelet plug formation, which as the name implies, are platelets coming to the area. And then finally, blood coagulation. So these are going to be most effective when you have small injuries as opposed to massive blood loss. So vascular spasms, as I said, the blood vessel is going to contract. It's stimulated by the blood vessel getting cut or broken. And then that smooth muscle is going to rapidly start contracting like a spasm. It's going to bring the ends together wherever the cut is. It's going to bring those two ends together. And sometimes that's enough and it'll close completely. But no matter what, it's going to slow the blood loss. Again, those pain receptors in our blood vessel walls are going to trigger this to happen. The response lasts a few minutes, but the effect can actually continue for up to 30. That's going to allow time for the platelets to get to the area, the plug to be formed, and then for our blood to finally coagulate. 
Serotonin is also released to cause vasoconstriction to help further reduce that blood loss. So once the blood vessel breaks, it releases chemicals that are going to attract platelets to the area. Positive feedback is going to get more platelets to the area through chemotaxis. Remember, positive feedback, there's only really two in the body that matter, and that's childbirth and platelet plug formation. So the platelets are going to adhere to each other and to the rough edges of the cut and form a plug. Finally, blood coagulation occurs within 5 to 15 minutes, and obviously this is going to be the most effective mechanism. A blood clot is going to be formed in a cascade, which is basically just a series of reactions where one step is going to activate the next one. There's two different ways it can be initiated, either extrinsically or intrinsically. Chemicals that are used are called clotting factors, and we have 12 of them. Vitamin K is necessary for some of these clotting factors to be formed. And of course, coagulation is going to depend on the balance between procoagulants and anticoagulants. So things that are trying to make coagulation happen and things that are trying to go against it. The major event that happens is the conversion of the soluble fibrinogen to insoluble threads of fibrin. And then that fibrin is going to trap those blood cells, and it's going to cause the clot to form. So this is the final step of blood coagulation. This is showing you the three mechanisms to stop blood loss, vascular spasms, platelet plug formation, and blood coagulation. So the extrinsic clotting method is going to be triggered by blood coming in contact with tissues outside of the blood vessels or the damaged wall of the blood vessel. The damaged tissues are going to release tissue thromboplastin, which is factor three. This is not found in the blood. That's going to initiate the cascade, which is going to involve the sequential activation of several clotting factors. The major steps that happen our thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen into the fibrin threads. Fibrinogen is soluble in the blood, fibrin is insoluble. So thrombin catalyzes that conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. The fibrin is then going to stick to the blood vessel surfaces and trap those blood cells and platelets, forming the blood clot. Again, as I said earlier, this is a positive feedback mechanism. Once the clotting starts, it's going to promote additional clotting. The intrinsic clotting mechanism can actually start without tissue damage. If the blood comes into contact with a foreign surface like collagen, instead of the normal endothelium of the blood vessel wall, it's going to activate the intrinsic method. It's triggered by factor 7, which is actually found inside the blood. Like the extrinsic clotting mechanism, that's going to start a cascade effect with several clotting factors. Then it's going to result in the formation of a fibrin mesh and a blood clot, just like the extrinsic pathway. So here are the steps. So what triggers it? The initiation and extrinsic versus intrinsic clotting. So here's a chart to show you, if you're a visual learner, the extrinsic pathway versus the intrinsic pathway. It's very important to notice that factor 10 is where they find the common pathway. So from that point on, the method is the same. So factor 10 is going to combine with factor 5, and that's going to cause prothrombin activator to convert prothrombin into thrombin. And then thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, which is then going to trap the blood vessels and form that fibrin clot. This is a list of the clotting factors, 1 through 13. Yes, there's only 12. Factor 6, what they used to think was factor 6 through further analysis, turns out is just a combination of factors 5 and 10. So what happens after the blood clot forms? Well, first of all, it's going to retract and pull the edges of that broken blood vessel together. 
while squeezing serum from the clot. Serum is just the plasma without the fibrinogen and the clotting factors. Platelet-derived growth factor is going to stimulate those smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts to repair the damaged blood vessel wall. Then plasmin is going to digest that fibrin clot and dissolve the blood clot. A thrombus is an abnormal blood clot that forms in a blood vessel, and an embolus is a blood clot moving through the blood vessels. You probably have heard of an embolism. That's when a blood clot dislodges, and a pulmonary embolism, for example, is when it gets stuck in your lungs, and those are deadly. Thrombosis is a blood clot in a vessel supplying a vital organ like the brain or the heart. An infarction are the death of tissues which have blocked blood vessels due to blood clot formation. Embolism, as I just said, is a blood clot that travels and then is going to block a blood vessel in an organ, like a pulmonary embolism in the lungs. And atherosclerosis is an accumulation of fat in the arterial linings that can sometimes cause that abnormal clot formation. And this is a common form of thrombosis. And then those pictures there show you a normal artery compared to one that has a bunch of plaque buildup. Deep vein thrombosis is clot formation because of the pooling of stagnant blood. Oftentimes this happens in the femoral or popliteal veins or the deep veins of the pelvis. Oftentimes it occurs if you are not moving for very long. And oftentimes it happens because the valves in our blood vessels and our veins get weakened. Serious complications are pulmonary embolism, of course, which that blood clot's going to dislodge and travel through the circulation and then lodge in a pulmonary blood vessel. And whatever portion of the lung that blood vessel was supplying will be blocked. As I said, it occurs with prolonged periods of immobility like an airplane flight. Symptoms, you have deep muscle pain, cramping, swelling, redness, dilation of the surface veins. The clot can break off hours or days after formation. So how do we prevent coagulation? Well, remember the blood vessel lining is very smooth, so things aren't going to grab onto it. So platelets and clotting factors are not going to accumulate there normally. As the clot forms, the fry burden is going to absorb or latch on to that thrombin, and it's going to prevent the clotting reaction from spreading. Antithrombin is going to inactivate additional thrombin by binding to it and blocking its action on fibrinogen. So basically, antithrombin is going to prevent thrombin from allowing fibrinogen to convert into fibrin. There's also basophils and mast cells that secrete heparin, which is an anticoagulant. Because basically, when our blood coagulates, we want it to stay in that area. We want it to stay in the area that's damaged. We don't want the clot to spread. So here's some factors that inhibit clot formation, like we just talked about. Blood groups. In 1910, the ABO blood antigen gene explained our blood types. Blood types are distinguished by the proteins on the surfaces of the red blood cells. On the, red surf on the surface of a red blood cell, we have what's called an antigen. Whatever antigen you have, so whatever surface protein you have, that is the blood type you are. Whatever antigen you have, you have the opposite antibody. So what that means is if you are type A, you have the A antigen on your red blood cells you have the B antibody, which is why if you're type A blood and you get a type B transfusion, your body will actually attack it. On the reverse side, if you are type B, that means that you have the B antigen on your red blood cells and you have antibody A. If you are type AB, you have both A and B antigens on your red blood cells and you don't have any antibodies. You can't because if you had an antibody, you would attack yourself because you have both A and B antigens. And that's the opposite for type O. If you're type O, you don't have any antigens on your surfaces or red blood cells, but you have both antibodies. So you have antibody A and antibody B. So type O people can only get type O blood. 
anything else will attack. So again, the antigen is any molecule that evokes an immune response. So those are the surface markers on our bodies. If the immune system finds a foreign antigen in the body, it's going to produce antibodies against it. Antibodies are proteins that react against a specific antigen. So if you have an incompatible blood transfusion, the donor red blood cells are going to elicit that immune response and the antibodies are going to attack it and agglutinate, so clump together. Agglutination is clumping together and that's going to occur if an antibody is going to encounter its antigen. There are 33 known antigens on the red blood cell membranes, but only a few of them evoke a serious reaction with transfusions. Only the antigens of the ABO and RH groups evoke these reactions. So the ABO blood group is based on the presence of either antigen A or antigen B. These are carbohydrates. The antibodies are associated with some blood types. So basically a person is gonna produce the antibody against whatever antigen isn't present. So here's a chart showing you, you have A blood type, you've got the A antigen and antibody B. B blood type, you've got the B antigen and antibody A. AB blood type, you've got the A and the B antigen, so you do not have any antibodies. And type O, you don't have any antigens, so you have both antibodies. This is just a chart showing you the frequencies of the ABO blood types in the US. Type O is always the most common for the most part. Type AB is the most rare. And then type A and B kind of flip-flop depending on the year. Here's pictures showing you. So you've got the A antibody, which means you have the B antigen and your type B. If you have no antibodies, that means you have both antigens, so you're type AB. If you have the B antibody, that means you have the A antigen and you're type A. And if you have both antibodies, that means you don't have any antigen and you're type O. And you need to understand this for your homework. So remember, whatever your blood type is, that is the antigen that you have. Whatever antigen you have, you have the opposite antibody. So A antigen means B antibody. B antigen means A antibody. A and B antigens means no antibody. Both antibodies means no antigens. When red blood cells come into contact with the antibodies against them, they're going to agglutinate, which means clumping together. Type O is known as the universal donor because it doesn't have any antigens to elicit a response from the person's immune system. So everybody can get type O blood. Type AB is known as the universal recipient. Type AB does not have any antibodies, so they can't attack any blood. So anybody can get type O, but type O can only receive type O. Doesn't seem fair. Type AB can get any blood at all. So the best blood type obviously is type AB because you can get donations from anybody but type O can donate to everybody. Okay, so type O is a universal donor, AB is a universal recipient. The RH blood group was named for the rhesus monkey. That's where it was first studied. It has several antigens. Most important one is antigen D. RH positive means antigen. The RH blood group was named for the rhesus monkey. Rh positive means you have the antigen. Rh negative means you do not have the antigen. Anti-Rh antibodies form if an Rh negative individual is in the presence of Rh positive. So the only time this really is a problem, it's a big problem, is in pregnant women. If a woman is Rh negative, and she is pregnant with an RH positive baby. The first time around, 
usually everything is fine. But when she gives birth to that baby, the placenta detaches and the blood mixes momentarily, which exposes the mother to Rh positive blood. She will start making antibodies against it. So if she gets pregnant again with an Rh positive baby, we're going to have erythroblastosis fatalis or hemolytic disease of the newborn. And basically, her body will want to attack the fetus. Luckily, there's a shot now called the Rogam shot that the women can get. There's not a problem. But if you're thinking about having a baby, you really need to know if you are positive or negative. So here's a picture showing you the Rh negative female with an Rh positive fetus and what will happen. And then here's some other inherited disorders. So erythrocytosis, your reticulocytes have the extra EPO receptors, which is going to enhance stamina. Sickle cell, we kind of talked about in the last type. Hemophilia, you have specific clotting factors missing. Hemophilia was really prominent in Queen Victoria's family. It is a sex link disorder, so it's carried on the X chromosome. Factor VIII is the most common missing clotting factor. So that is it for the second half of chapter 14. As always, if you have any questions, just let me know.